wrong do I have? To? Almost 30. Okay. And now, okay, up to now, uh, we have treated essentially the so called energy range. The energy range is the one I mentioned it yesterday. We have an operator equal to something, which is a distribution, something. And the energy range is, uh, is the one for which D belongs <coughs> to the dual. of the natural energy space. For instance, when uh, this is the Pilaplacian operator, and this is something like this, <coughs> this means that that belongs to LP. Uh, uh, yesterday we have seen that, uh, and we have analyzed two different situations. The, the first situation is where this <coughs> one is the beta Laplacian operator, eventually with the parabolic part. And the second situation where this is a non-uniformly elliptic operator, and the right-hand side is also supposed to be in the dual, because the initial condition in the second case was that f to the p plus a of x f to the q was in L1. This plays the same role. Now we analyze the situation where f is not in the dual. The, first, the only case I showed you up to now is this uh, theorem by Daniels and Bordone and uh, uh, Lewis that tells you that this can be considered in LP minus something, but no more than this. OK, another situation which is more treatable is when the right hand side is not in divergence form. And this is the case of measured data problems. And this is the case uh, that, uh, that can be studied, I mean, it's rather satisfying. There's a rather satisfying theory for this, for this case. So I'm going to consider these types of equations. And in particular, I could also consider a local version. But uh, just for simplicity, I will consider the Riclet problem. So I fix uh, a very good domain. I don't care about the smoothness of the boundary. So I'll take omega to be a ball. And the boundary data is 0. So this is a Borel measure with final total mass. And the assumptions are the same that I told you yesterday. This is a, consider that this is a p Laplacian operator. So in the linear case, this is a classical theorem of Lichtman and Stampaki and Weinberger. So existence. Otherwise, you go to the theory of, um, I mean, there are several theories. There are all kinds of possible notions of solutions. And all notions of solutions are equally good or bad according to your taste. Essentially, you want to find a class where to solve this problem in a unique way, and this problem is still open, but in a few cases. When mu is in L1, where, I mean, p is equal to n, but otherwise, there are um, solutions called solutions obtained by limiting approximations. This, is, this has been introduced by Bocard and Galois, essentially. Then you have ring normalized solutions by Dalmaso, Murat, Ursin, and Pernier. Then you have entropy solutions by Boccato and Galway and Orsina. All these solutions are proved in case that mu is a positive measure to be essentially equivalent. And this is a result by Kilperang and Kuusi and Tuola. Tuola uh, Fuya. Exactly. You can rely on him. This is the usual I mean, thing that, uh, I mean, this lady should really kill me. Because all this, because there's also another lecture which, which, that has been recorded. And I always do the same thing so she can look at this. OK, all these, all, all these definitions are equally bad. So I will take solutions by obtained by limiting approximations because um, they are at least easy to tell. So what you do, you take mu, you approximate in a smooth way or in an infinity way. You solve these problems because now the right hand side is in the dual. Uh, and then you find that uh, this is essentially Bocard and Galway proof that this UK are uh, strongly converging in W1, P minus 1. And the limit is a so-called solutions obtained by limiting approximation with the, with the acronym, uh, with, they are, I mean, called SOLA. OK, from now on, everything I'm going to talk about is about SOLA, but essentially these are the most general solutions you can obtain with these problems. OK. <coughs> The model examples are these ones, p Laplacian, p Laplacians with coefficients, non-autonomous versions, who cares? 
Okay, what's the, in some sense, uh, easiest but worst solution? The worst solution for these problems that uh, also tells you that, uh, that what is the limiting integrability or regularity that you might get is the so-called nonlinear Green's function, uh, which is given by this one. So this is the Dirac uh, mass uh, concentrating at, uh, at the origin. So essentially, this against the C infinity function gives the, the, the value of the, of the function at, at zero. So it concentrates everything uh, at that value. And uh, the solution, you can uh, essentially write, in, write this in a radial way, and you come up with this nonlinear Green's function. When p is equal to 2, this is the usual Green's function. Otherwise, it is what it is. Um, this is the worst possible solution, because the idea, as we are going to see, uh, soon is that um, the more the measure concentrates, the worse the solution is allowed to be. Because essentially you are saying that uh, uh, in all these problems you, you see immediately here that the solution is regular outside the origin because it's a solution of a usual Peter Blaschen operator. It's not actually this way because you don't start with, with an energy solution, but this is reasonable to, to imagine that this is true. Uh, essentially, uh, you can prove. Um, uh, Okay, although this is the worst possible solution, this is essentially the only non-trivial case where uniqueness is known. Uniqueness is known by a theorem of uh, Kishen, Asami, and Veron that tells you that all solutions concentrate, uh, all solutions of this equation concentrate as a nonlinear Green's function. And then you can apply um, a theorem of Sarin telling in turn that all solutions blowing up as the Green's function are uh, the Green's function. So this, um, in conclusion, this can be used to test the optimality of your results. And uh, there's a long list of people who contributed to this problem. Initially, Pocard and Galway, then there is the Finnish school. And they proved, in particular, the uh, fantastic estimates by Keith Palanian and Mali, uh, potential estimates I'm going to talk about, uh, to talk about uh, later. Then there are results uh, with other methods by Greco, Ivanets, and Bordeaux, and Fiorenz, and Bordeaux. And then there are also good results, very good results by Goldsman, Ugen, Müller, and Müller. And that's really, this is really a large number of, of, of authors who contributed this. Uh, essentially, the, 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 the best integrability result is what you expect, is that if you take u to the p minus 1, then this belongs to matching Kiewicz n over n minus 1. And this is the, essentially the type of integrability satisfied by the nonlinear Green's function, and it is therefore optimal. OK, what is Machinkiewicz? Machinkiewicz is, uh, is a space which is close enough to the relative LP space, but fails to be LP. It's slightly larger and fails because it, it contains potentials. This is the definition. So you take the soup of these guys, and you prescribe that this is infinity. So you say that, uh, that this is less than or equal, less, strictly less than infinity. So you prescribe uh, that the decay, uh, decay of level sets in this, in this way. So level sets are decaying fast enough to compensate the blow up of this quantity. Observe that this is in M gamma, and this is not in M gamma. So this is really the, uh, the main motivation of introducing Machikiewicz estimates. Machikiewicz spaces, they, they classify these kinds of functions. I mean, function spaces are nowadays used for their own sake, right? But uh, essentially, every time one introduces a function space, should have an important function in mind. Nowadays, we see function spaces with three, four, even six parameters. And then uh, very often there are no functions which are complicated enough to show up six parameters. But uh, I mean, function spaces should be introduced once you have a, an important, I mean, a function in mind. For instance, Lorentz spaces are still important because locks they they introduce they I introduce. Uh, I mean, they classify locks. But you get it, spaces are important because they classify this. OK, matching Kiewicz spaces are slightly larger than uh, Lebesgue spaces, but smaller than all the previous ones. So they interpolate in a fine way. They are an example of a two-parameter scale of spaces called Lorentz spaces. And uh, I don't, uh, OK, I will probably talk about Lorentz spaces later on.
Okay, the definition is motivated, and this fact is justified by the following fact. You write down this in trivially, you use, uh, this is still trivial, this is essentially Chebyshev. Now, if this is finite, you can plug in this, uh, you can take this here, you take the soup, and then you get this estimate showing you the inmetting I was telling you before. So that's how they naturally relate to, to the, the same uh, uh, Lebesgue spaces. Okay, and now, um, okay, the idea is now that uh, is that uh, Calderon Sigmund theory can be can be described when you're dealing with measures. You 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 remember that measures are not functions. And therefore, there's one thing that uh, usually functions do not do, that is concentrating on sets. And this is essentially what measures do in, with respect to functions. They concentrate on sets. That's, uh, that's the thing. And so there's another way to look at calderon sigmund theory is that it's not only when the right-hand side is in a certain LP, but when the right-hand side has a certain concentration. So the first, um, and uh, the result I wanted to, uh, there are two results I, I want to, to give you an example of. And this is the first result I obtained several years ago, 10 years by now. And this is telling you that if the measure concentrate, cannot, uh, doesn't, uh, I mean, does concentrate on sets of Hausdorff dimension, which is smaller than n minus theta, then the integrability of solutions improves accordingly. And improves, uh, and this is optimal, by a counterexample, by a theorem of Serenium. Yeah. It's easy to see that it's optimal because uh, otherwise you use, um, um, as it called, this um, this lemma that tells you that if you give me a um, this classical lemma that tells you that if you have a set with the house of dimension gamma, then you can concentrate uh, um, a measure on that set in a certain way, and then you apply a theorem of Seren telling you that you you would do, you would not <coughs> do better than this, but. Uh, observe that when theta is equal to n, so there's no condition, then you go back to the previous result. Otherwise, the more you get, uh, the more you get, uh, the less the measure, the, me the measure concentrates, the better the integrability of solution gets, because the solution being a solution cannot concentrate and blow up too much, uh, too fast on too large sets. Observe that when uh, theta goes to p. When theta is smaller than p, then this belongs to the dual, and then the solution is uh, actually in W1p, so the gradient is in LP. And in fact, when theta is equal to p, then this means that du is in LP, so the in, is in MP. So you are in the borderline case. So the, the result is, um, uh, is, is sharp. And uh, OK, as for the parabolic part, uh, the, the, the an existence of regularity theorem has been obtained by Boccardo, Dallaio, Galway, and Orsina. And this tells you that if you have a parabolic equation with this measure, then you can get a solution, which is once again the solutions obtained by limiting approximation, which is in this space. Uh, du is in LQ for every Q larger than B, and capital N is N plus 2 is the parabolic dimension. Also, this result is sharp. You cannot get better. This is, the, let's say, the analog, the parabolic analog of the first result on uh, integrability of solutions uh, for, uh, for, um, <coughs> for general solutions to uh, elliptic problems we measure data. This is the, the precise parabolic version. Of course, you might wonder if this theorem has an analog. And actually, this is a very delicate theorem of Paolo Baroni, who proves the following, uh, the following result. And uh, this is very, very delicate. Uh, why? Um, okay, first of all, observe that uh, there's essentially the same statement. Here you replace uh, the dimension by the parabolic dimension. Here you get the same exponent of Boccardo and Galway and Orsini uh, and, uh, and Alaglio uh, when, uh, when theta is exactly equal to these guys. So there's no condition. You get the same result plus the additional borderline condition, and otherwise you get uh, you get this uh, this intermediate this intermediate object. The, the proof of this theorem is comparably more difficult than the proof of my theorem. Uh, why? Um, 
uh, he, uh, actually, this paper does more than, uh, than um, uh, observing this theorem, but settles a, a, a very delicate question, which is the following one. Yesterday, we have seen, that's why this, I mean, this, this paper is, uh, uh, I think it's, it's very remarkable. Uh, if you look at this, uh, this, uh, this operator, let me give a brief survey of what I was telling you yesterday about the intrinsic geometries. So uh, then if you want to analyze this in case different than two, then you go to the Benedetto's intrinsic geometries. Intrinsic geometries means that you are not considering poles, but intrinsic cylinders, and we consider the case P larger than two, but intrinsic cylinders, where the intrinsic cylinders are done in the following way. This is centered at x dot, and the other one is x dot minus gamma to the two minus p rho squared p zero. So when p is equal to two and gamma is equal to one, this is the standard parabolic cylinder. That is the cylinder which is used there. Otherwise, you get these cylinders. And these cylinders are those ones you use to treat intrinsic geometries because the intrinsic geometry prescribes that you only use cylinders where a condition of this type is satisfied. And this is, uh, let's say, q, gamma, rho, x dot, e dot, and this is q, gamma, rho. So if you get that du of the same cylinder is more or less like lambda, then you can go on with the estimates. And now you see what is the bad point here. The bad point is that this is called intrinsic because it depends on the solution itself. Very good, but then the thing <coughs> here this condition is not satisfied on any cylinder, which is, uh, let's say, a posteriori, potentially an intrinsic cylinder. This is satisfied only on a certain family of cylinders. Now, how to translate this condition into a condition which is only on very special cylinder? This is uh, essentially very non-trivial. That's why all type of Mori estimates have not been proved for parabolic equations. I actually refereed and rejected several papers where the authors were claiming that, uh, that they were doing this, and they didn't realize that uh, they were using Mori conditions, not on just a family of cylinders, but on every cylinder, which is not implied by that. See? And so this is uh, essentially a paper where this is done in a very good, uh, in a very good way. So this is, in fact, uh, uh, it's, uh, the, 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 there are I mean, very, very delicate situations uh, that, are, that are faced in this. Uh, and this paper tells you essentially the same philosophy. If the measure doesn't concentrate a lot, then the gradient integrability improves accordingly. The less the measure concentrates, the better integrability uh, the gradient you get. That's, uh, that's, uh, that's a thing. OK, this is one direction of cardinal Zygmunt theory. And the other direction goes, amongst, uh, goes towards differential theory. OK, welcome back, fractional ensemble of spaces. Let me recall you what WS gamma is. WS gamma is defined by all LSL gamma functions such that the blow up of this kernel is uh, compensated by the oscillations of, uh, of P. This quantity should be thought as DSP. There's a way that Daniel Spector knows very well to, to write it down in this way. Right? They are their own embedding. So essentially, this quantity, uh, which is called the Gallardo norm, by the name of Emilio Gallardo, who introduced them in the context of the nonlinear interpolation theory at the end of the 50s, this should be thought as an S derivative for the gamma. Should be thought because if you scale by the usual blow up, these scales as formally, this would be S and gamma, essentially. That's why you always see multiplication of S and gamma. That's the, the combined scale. OK. And now we go to the, to the higher order estimates. And that's another theorem that I would like to recall from what I was proving over the last years. So if you, if you consider this equation, you know that if this is in L gamma, then the second derivatives are in L gamma. This is true provided gamma is larger than 1 and less than infinity, of course. When gamma is equal to 1, this is not true. On the other hand, for general elliptic equations, and let me just consider the case p equal to 2, 
for general elliptic equations, nonlinear elliptic equations, what you can prove in this is Boccardo Galway uh, is that you get the same integrability of the Green's function, no matter if the equation is nonlinear. Okay. Uh, what's the difference between this information and this information? This is about second derivatives, this is about first derivatives. Uh, so you don't know at this stage more than integrability of first derivatives of these equations, but these equations are, um, um, are second order, at least formally, the operator is second order operator. So you don't think that uh, this should be the maximum integrability. This is essentially what uh, was the highlight of the theory of uh, regularity about uh, until uh, these results and uh, now the point is that uh, you don't you don't know in this case that uh, you is you don't know that this is true because by counterexample it's not known but you can uh, you can prove under these assumptions essentially you cannot get this guy you cannot get this guy but under reasonable assumptions, like for instance differentiability, classical assumptions, I mean, let's say you have first derivatives on A, then you can prove that you are almost in W11 in the sense that you can uh, subtract every epsilon here. So you are not in W11, but you are almost in W11. The proof is, uh, is very delicate, it involves a new technique that uh, uses some sort of, um, let's say, Nonlinear atomic decompositions for fractional uh, ensemble spaces functions, but actually tells you that you get if you are not in W11, you are almost there. <coughs> so the trick is uh, is to use this uh, sort of uh, um, let's say nonlinear atomic decompositions. Nonlinear atomic decompositions are a way to classify fractional spaces. So <coughs> essentially, what you do what you do in absolute theory of fractional spaces is that you can represent a fractional sample of space as a double series essentially what you do you, you make a double series of pumps you take one scale, you, you select one mesh, let's say a mesh of um, a 1 over 2 to the n, and then you, you put this. You take one grid. Then on each grid, you put a bump function, which is co called an atom, which is actually an harmonic function. And then you put coefficients in a way that this is converging when you sum up over all on the whole grid and on all meshes. And these are typically harmonic functions. So they satisfy. I mean, these equations. If you want to use this guy, types of decompositions, which are typical in little group Pelly theory, and you apply with uh, in, uh, in in problems of uh, of the type uh, Laplacian of view, something which is moderately nonlinear, then they are still working. This is what they do usually in uh, in the in the analysis of dispersive equations and blah blah. But if you want to, to, to use it, for instance, for something which is very nonlinear, for P Laplacian, they, they are essentially useless <coughs> because, uh, because the problem is strongly nonlinear. So the idea is that you do something similar, but you replace and use as atoms not harmonic functions, but solutions of uh, these guys. They are. They, they do enjoy some properties, some good properties of harmonic functions up to a certain extent because they are solutions, but they have the advantage of being closer to the solution of, of the problem you want to use. For instance, P Laplacian. This is essentially the idea. And then you can prove differentiability of them. So you essentially you you don't you are not using the, the you are not using the, the, the atomic decomposition, but you take the idea of atomic decomposition and you plug in at the PD level, exactly as uh, we did yesterday for the, for the calderon zygmunt exit time argument at the level of a PD. So you don't use the decomposition, but you use the ideas to make the, the decompositions directly at the PD level, and you hook up the new thing. So that's the linkage. So this is when P is equal to 2, as I told you. And uh, this comes together with the local Cacioppoli estimate. 
And this Kachov polyestimate is a fractional Kachov polyestimate that also works for truncation of the gradients. In fact, I will show you then how to use this, uh, how to use this uh, fractional Kachov polyestimate to implement eventually a fractional version of the George exaggeration. That's the same version I eventually discovered that simultaneously were doing Kaffein in the Serin paper of a few years ago that started this fractional analysis. Actually, uh, the difference here is that I start from a local equation that's the whole effort is to get that the fractional inequality is still, is still true, while in their case, they start from a fractional operator, so the fractional Kachopoli inequality comes directly, and then the iteration is, uh, is similar. <coughs> Um, uh, okay, what happens when p is different than 2? Let's check the best integrability you might get. The best integrability you catch, of course, you want to, you want to, uh, to test it with the fundamental solution. So we play a bit with 1 over x to the gamma, to the beta. We say when this is here, if I remember correctly, this is under this condition. Then we apply this back to the fundamental solution. So we apply this to this n minus 1 and p minus 1. So we fix the lowest possible, uh, um, so we maximize in some sense the, so okay, we fix the canonical, uh, 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 actually this doesn't maximize, it's minimizing away, but we fix the canonical choice gamma to the p minus 1 because uh, the P minus one power is the, 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 the let's say the power that uh, that is linked to the whole stress tensor, and then we say that if we choose gamma equals to P minus one here, then we should get every s over less than one over P minus one for the fundamental solution. So this, uh, if you analyze the fundamental solution, then this should be the best possible result, which of course coincides. Uh, with the previous one when p is equal to 2. OK, this is the, the ansatz, and this is, in fact, the result. That's exactly what you get. Let's say this is the, uh, let's say, uh, the, the, uh, this can be considered as the maximal regularity for general measured data problems. That's uh, no, the maximal regularity. And being the maximal regularity, it implies the previous regularity. Because by embedding, you get by, OK, first of all, you observe that also in this case, this is optimal. Because if this would be true with epsilon equal to 0, then you use embedding, and then you prove that u is here, but this is not here. The fundamental solution is not there. So you cannot put epsilon equal to 0. Why? Because uh, these spaces have their own embeddings. If you would be, if the gradient would be here, that's, this would embed here, but the fundamental solution is in this matching carriage, not in this space. So this is going to be the case. And using the same argument, then you see that this uh, recovers the first result of Bocard and Galois by embedding. It. And this is usually the case, right? When you, you recover by embedding the intermediate regularity from the maximal one. You, And um, finally, uh, let's see how this, uh, this regularity connects with the one of the fundamental solution, when the right-hand side is very good. Observe that the rate of elder continuity is uh, 1 over p minus 1. And this is actually linked to the shape of the problem. Because when, uh, when you solve p Laplacian equal to 1, so you don't expect, uh, you expect that the, that the integrability improves, but the elder continuity is the same one, because the elder continuity is linked to the operator. And in fact, this is this guy, which is uh, observed that this is in uh, W1 over P minus 1 infinity, because the right hand side is in an infinity. So the integrability is improved uh, with, uh, with uh, as the right hand side, but the other continuity becomes the same. And uh, so essentially, this is the maximum regularity for measured data problems. And, uh, and uh, <coughs> And uh, this stems the maximal regularity. So in the next lectures, I'm going to talk about now potential estimates and going on on this uh, um, measured other problems. It's OK. OK. That's